My name is Tina Hollenbeck, Secretary of the Planning Commission. I'd like to call or call to order the Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, May 14th. It's approximately 7 o'clock p.m. Um, meeting's called to order. Seating of alternates. I think we have. I don't think we need to seat anyone. I think we're all set there. Do we need to seat an alternate for Mike? We need to seat an alternate for Mike. Mike and okay. Bill? Yes. Would you like to sure. sit for Mike? And do we need also do one for Bill? I yes. I, I, could I, yeah. Yes. Because I think later on you're going to have a can you have a question. Yeah. Yep. So, yes. Okay. Who would like to seat for? That's me. Okay. Bob will seat yep. for Madam Bill. Madam Chairman, a reminder to speak loudly for sure. those of us who are. Impaired. Impaired. Okay. A year older. Okay. Bob will uh, sit as an alternate for Bill Rice. Okay. So we've seated our alternates. The next item on the agenda is um, discussion of possible action for application 1330, requesting subdivision of property located at 46 Silvercrest Drive to allow for the creation of lots five, five lots, excuse me, zone R40. Thank you. Uh, at the last meeting, um, the public hearing was closed, and then uh, a number of commissioners had questions about drainage on the project. Because the hearing's closed, there's some more public comment this evening, but you asked me to uh, invite Bruce Sawitsky, town engineer, uh, to come and talk a little bit about the drainage on that, that property. So I asked him to come, which is all ready to go, and, and give you a little uh, explanation of various parts of the drainage. And then any questions that you want to have, I assume we can. Into those. If you decide to get to the point of uh, make line and make a decision, then that's fine. I have some more information for you. I can give you that. Uh, if you decide to uh, postpone, that's so we can talk about that. Okay. I agree. Good evening. Um, I can do this a couple ways. Uh, I, I could do a, a bit of a presentation, or I can answer questions that you might directly have, and, um, whatever your pleasure is. Okay. Gentlemen, if you have questions for uh, Rich, I mean, we'll go right ahead, please. To uh, Reader's Digest, the major concern, I think, of the neighbors was, will the drainage be the same conditions as they are now, better or worse, after the development is done? I mean, and, and everybody expressed, if you read the minutes, everybody's very concerned about runoff, and, and they want to know if it's going to be the same or better or, or worse. And, and that was, to me, the major issue that mm -hmm. everybody presented. Okay. Well, let me um, kind of go through a, a general policy that we have. Simsbury operates under a stormwater management plan, uh, which has been in effect for many years. And I'm going to show you the basic principle behind it. Um, and, and that plan has been modified over the years to include <coughs> uh, more retention of the water on site and where the soil conditions are good to uh, infiltrate the water into the ground, which is kind of just a good principle in terms of water management. But the, the principles that we have is that systems cannot increase the peak rates of runoff. And it's the rate, the velocity, two feet per second. So if you look at a big macro picture like the Farmington River Basin, you know, what happens in a storm, it'll start running, and you get cubic feet per second, gallons per second running off over time. The storm continues on and on. You get a peak flow finally in the river. And, and for the Farmington, this is a matter of days when that happens, and then it tapers off. If we have a development happening near the river, our policy says, well, you dump that water quick. Because the theory is you don't want to hold that water so long that its peak rate of runoff starts to overlap the river's peak. So you get rid of the water so it doesn't add. For a development far away from the river, and this would apply to something like Knob Brook, to the same, you know, pretty big water. Sure. Mm -hmm. You would want to delay that long enough so it's beyond the, the peak and, and uh, not look in the river. So that's kind of the big picture. And, and we actually take a look at that uh, 
particular situation in this project for Nodbrook. We wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't delaying the runoff in such a way that we would overlap the peak. And that's important, obviously, for any place where the brook goes through a yard, if it's going through culverts, uh, we don't want to have any problems in our system. For a specific neighborhood, such as what we're dealing with here, we're going to look at the existing runoff situation. It's kind of depicted by that blue curve with a peak up here. And then we take a look at what's going on with the development. Well, obviously, if you just put in streets, roofs, change the character, you're going to increase uh, the volume and the rate of runoff. And what our policy says is, OK, that amount of water, which can be calculated, between the existing and the proposed has to be controlled. Because obviously you can see that if you let it run off uncontrolled, it will go faster. That could be a problem in the culvert. It could be a problem in an individual's uh, property where there's a brook. So we're saying you've got to keep that peak rate down and store all of that. Uh, it is possible if you store enough of it uh, where you could actually get that proposed curve to be even less. But normally our policy says you have to keep it the same. And that again is for a drain system, pipes going into somebody's channel. You also have the question of uh, runoff direct from a property that does not go into a brook, does not go into a channel. So when I took a look at uh, this, and you know, we spent a lot of time with the developer telling them how we wanted to see it. And basically we told them we do not want to see any increase in velocity of that runoff, and we don't want to see any increase in the runoff on the adjoining properties. The situation that exists out here right now, and this is north, Hill the Crest is here, Bushy Hill's over there, uh, Lawton is over here. There's a high ridge kind of through the center of that property. Right now the water runs off directly onto the other properties as depicted by those orange arrows. So when it rains, the water builds up. This soil is kind of interesting. It does absorb some amount of water, but it then hits a relatively impervious hard pan layer, uh, especially in spring conditions, heavy rain conditions. Once that top layer is saturated, the water runs off pretty quick. Uh, we have a, a drainage system in Hildecrest, and this is a subject property. Uh, there's catch basins, pipes, and uh, they actually there's a system that comes up through the lots to an easement. It comes out a pipe, it goes into a channel, and it goes into a, a bit of a brook system out here on properties on Bushy Hill Road. These yellow uh, or orange circles were kind of areas we saw as uh, critical. Um, up on Hildecrest itself, there's a couple sections of smaller pipe. We asked the developer to assert and, and ascertain that those would not be overloaded and overflow. Right. We know there's a couple problems in the brooks and channels where they can overflow down here behind House 64 and the houses on Bushingo Road. So it became very important that those velocities or runoff do not increase. And with these there, there's several ways of achieving that. Uh, you can build a pond, which really isn't possible on a small piece of property. But if you recall the Dorset Crossing subdivision, they have large holding ponds, and then they have a controlled outlet device. So you have a big pipe coming into the pond, you have a small outlet, the water goes up in the pond and slowly goes away. If you have very excellent soil conditions, um, such as the elegant Riverview Center, the Elephant Banquet facility. All sand and gravels, they have huge chambers underground with openings in them surrounded by stone and water all goes into the ground. Virtually nothing comes out of that system. Uh, other types of systems, such as in this area where you don't have room for a pond, you don't have very good soils, you basically have to build an underground structure. And that, that is what they've done on this street. Uh, there's about 500 feet of 30 inches a diameter pipe, which is way bigger than what you would need just for the runoff. But what that is doing is storing the water. And at the end of the system, there's a small diameter pipe. 
So when the rainfall starts and you get excess beyond what exists right now, it keeps being stored. And then over time, it releases it very slowly. What happens in this uh, particular subdivision is that the road proposed street becomes a low point and all the water inside this blue area is now directed to the street which in turn goes into the catch basins and into the holding chamber which is depicted all the way up through the center here. <coughs> And the water from the street itself. Now, right now, as if you recall, I told you there was a high point in here. Mm -hmm. but the way they built this street, coming up a hill and down a hill, these pipes are deep enough so that they're all going this <coughs> way. So they hold all the runoff. So instead of this flow that used to just go onto an adjacent property, the roof, the driveway, the front yards, as well as the roof drains. The roof drains come in through what's known as a rain garden. Which kind of purifies the water and, and slows it down. Any overflow also goes into that system. And that's true on these first three homes. And then all of the turnaround also goes into the system. So basically the end result is that there's a lot less uh, overland flow that was going on to adjacent properties than before. And that underground storage system is designed to pick up the increased amount of rainfall runoff, which obviously occurs off roofs, driveways, and roads. All goes into that holding system. And that holding system is designed for a range of storms from a 10-year, yeah, what's known as a 10-year storm event. What that means, a 10-year storm event, is statistical a probability of a storm happening once every 10 years. Well, in terms of the formula, it's the amount of rainfall that happens in a 24-hour period. Uh, what we look at to analyze these changes is the uh, type of ground cover, and they have a coefficient called a coefficient of runoff. And if it's all trees, it, it has one number. If it's all roofs or paving, it has a higher number. We then have lawns. They do an average, a weighted number, and then they calculate that, including the slope of the land uh, and that storm event, the intensity of the rainfall, put that all into a formula and that's how you end up getting those two feet per cent second. And you do it both for existing and proposed and you calculate that difference and that's what you start. And then you let it run off slowly. And in, these case, in this case, it'll actually reduce that peak rate of runoff because it'll store enough so rather than running off at this rate, it'll be running off more slowly. Well, so that's kind of the theory. They, uh, we we <coughs> reviewed, reviewed the uh, calculations. Uh, the most important part of those reviews are those factors that I mentioned. The, uh, the runoff coefficients, <coughs> making sure they are properly accounted for the ground cover. Uh, we looked at the areas we looked at those rainfall intensities to make sure those were appropriate. Those intensities are adjusted also for how long it takes for the water to get there. If the water gets to this system very quickly, it, it automatically increases that intensity so we even have more storage. Okay. From, from what I understand, there's already some issues with um, some of the properties having water at certain times of the year, four to five inches in their lawn. Will this new system improve upon that? This, this will take away the surface water for the immediate close houses because it's, it's as I showed you on that first drawing, right. uh, where we went through that high point, looking at rubber ones. And whereas in, in this condition, it's just running right off. Right. And so now if you look at that this drainage line, we've taken away a lot of the overland flow that used to just go to the adjacent houses. It will help that situation. Um, as I mentioned before, this um, soil allows the water to go in for a ways, and it hits the impervious layer. So 
let's say we get into a really big rainfall event, that surface water won't be getting to the adjacent houses, but it will not always reduce the high ground water. The high ground water just happens right. where it happens. Except for what I'll call the regional high ground water. Uh, public sanitary sewers are going to go into this stream. And those sewers are bedded on stone, stone base. And what we will ask them to do is when this sewer comes down towards the bottom of the hill, we'll ask them to put a uh, perforated pipe in that stone to collect that water and put it into the storm system. So that can reduce, you know, what I'll call the regional high ground water. Mm -hmm. So you're going to reduce the overland flow. You won't see as much water running off. <coughs> And in terms of the longer term, high groundwater will reduce that. But it, it will not reduce, you know, if it decides it's going to rain six inches, it goes into the ground, hits that impervious layer, and builds up in the ground. Right. It won't make that right. go away because that's happening right there. And that, that sounds a little crazy, but I used to do a lot of groundwater monitoring for some big properties, and it is amazing. We had a cutoff trench, you know, very deep. Well, the surface water all went away, and we went the time that there was high groundwater in the year went away. If you had a really big rainfall of that year, you're still going to have some high groundwater. But the surface water will go away, and your uh, longer duration groundwater will reduce. Rich, will the properties at the back side, the last two weren't included inside that blue circle thing you drew? Um, yeah. So will the properties on the back side, the neighbors, experience any improvement in their runoff into their yards? They will because that high ground, uh, high uh, elevation line comes yeah. right through here. So whereas all of this was running off, all of that within the pool was not going to go into the storage system. So will we expect a moderate improvement or? Yeah, yeah we would. Okay. So all, all that, that locally on the lot will also be slowed down by those rain tires. Yep. So all the driveways have a slope down to the road? Um, all of the ones within the blue. These two do not. But again, you're, you're taking all of this natural ground, the lump this way, and taking about 30% of the water into the storage system. Does the removal of some of the trees that I read about affect any of that drainage? Does it make it worse? Could it make it worse? It's kind of interesting. The, the, the trees during certain parts of the year have a, a feature called trans evaporation. And what that means is a lot of water is being taken up by the trees and into the leaves and evaporates. Mm -hmm. um, that does not happen in the winter when the ground scrolls. Right. It only happens in the summer. Um, interesting enough, lawn, good lawns and shrubs almost have the same uh, capability to perform that function. Uh, but when you do that calculation, that curve number I mentioned, the uh, coefficient of runoff, that takes that into account because the number is higher, uh, obviously higher for loose and driveways and higher for lawns. So that's made up in the underground storage. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Rich has answered most of them as far as the um, liability of this system that they're putting in. He assures us that um, you know the system is capable of reducing the actual uh, and not exacerbating it. Right. And that's that was my biggest concern because uh, I just don't want it to affect the downstream properties that exist from Bushy Hill all the way up to the um, mm -hmm. Hildecrest Circle. Uh, but since this is going to actually slightly reduce it, at least not exacerbate it, it's not going to, and it's capturing a lot of the surface runoff that's in that space. Um, his explanation seems to surprise as far as my concern. And these systems are, we have these in town. <coughs> Excellent maintenance program. Questions? Yeah, real quick. Uh, Rich, you said excellent maintenance programs. 
uh, who would be uh, responsible for that maintenance? Public Works. Public Works. And we have, uh, you know, some of the problems with a lot of these systems used to be sand getting into them. Mm -hmm. There's sand anymore. So mm -hmm. we still vacuum all the systems once a year and sweep once a year. And that's all the catch bases have to put deep sumps to catch anything. An important part of this will be during the construction phase to use good erosion control to keep you know, any sediment from getting into the system. And the property owners are responsible for the rain garden areas? Because I know when I have a divot in my lawn like that, I always want to fill it in. So, I mean, how do we make sure they keep them there? Yep. Yeah, that's critical. Yeah. You know, hopefully there's been a lot of discussion you know, in terms of environmental consciousness and benefit of these facilities, so people who are really more aware. But yeah, the public piece is always a little easier to assure <laughs> in terms of maintenance. But again, the rain gardens are a small uh, contributing factor to the solution. Okay. Is there anything that would you like to add? Anything? No, I didn't know, Jeremy. If you uh, decide that uh, that you're ready to Make a, take action, then I, I have some other information for you, and I can give to you. Well, if you decide you want to postpone it, you can decide that. Okay. So, gentlemen, would you would you like to move forward with taking a vote tonight, or do you want to hear more information? Make a decision at the next meeting, or? I think we can move forward. I they've answered the questions that I had. Okay. How about you, Hiram? So, I, agree, I agree with Gary, yeah, but I think we can move forward. Okay. Do we have a motion? Does someone like to make a motion? I uh, agree with this. I can kind of drag it through. It's a little bit longer. Okay. okay. <coughs> Did we talk about that first item yeah. first? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hiram? Yes. the uh, applicant was clear that uh, lot number five uh, had a, a buildable rectangle that needs to fit in that lot. And in this case, and, and typically what happens is that buildable rectangle fits within the, the required setbacks of the lot. In this case, there was a four and a half foot, uh, it was four and a half feet shy on one side. The buildable rectangle is a lot shape requirement. It's not a lot size requirement. The lot size in this case is in excess of 45,000 square feet, even though the minimum is 40,000 square feet. So the lot size is quite adequate. There's no question about that. The lot is a little bit longer than, uh, than it is rectangular. And so what the, re the applicant is requesting is that the, a waiver, which is within the commission's jurisdiction and authority, if it chooses to do that, um, that that be that that be waived. Um, the way that I've constructed this, should you decide to do that, is that I've made several suggestions to you, um, and they're listed there on page one of three. Um, and I want to be really clear about this. Let me go through that, and in case you have any other questions, you please bring them up. The applicant requested the waiver of the building rectangle on lot five, and it's shown on map uh, sheet S one of the subdivision application package. It's important that the commission and the public also and the neighbors also understand that this is not a waiver of lot size or any lot setback requirement. And that any and all structures in the lot will be required to meet all existing setback requirements that are in effect. So that means this doesn't have anything to do with moving a structure closer to your neighbor. It's going to still have to be required to meet all the setbacks that are there in the regulations. It's also noted that while the subject lot is in an R40 zone, this is a 45,185 square foot lot, I mentioned that before. Um, it also has, as you may recall, there's a sewer easement uh, that comes across the front of the lot, which Rich talked about connecting into the sewer. That's also on uh, just off this lot, I'm sorry. 
and it's also just off the lot that there's a small section of open space on the corner of the slot and the, and the new drive. <coughs> um, on this, this waiver requests, based on the map and submitted materials, has a four and a half foot deficit that affects only the subject lot and not generally the applicable uh, other area, other land in the area. And that's important. That's part of the regulations. It's one of the things that we need to agree to if we do. Secondly, the granting of the waiver will not have an adverse effect on the adjacent property as required structure and building setbacks are still required to be met. In addition, the property is served by municipal sanitary sewer and has been studied with regard to stormwater drainage conditions. Based upon the written submission and testimony from the applicant's engineer and town staff, determinations of the waiver will not have any adverse effect on public health and safety. And that's one of the findings, again, that's in your regulations. The third finding that you need to agree to or make if you're going to grant this is that the granting of this waiver will not have a significant adverse effect on the appropriate and orderly development of the area or hinder appropriate development or use of land on adjoining properties. So it's not going to have any adverse impact on any adjoining properties. And that's a pretty reasonable expectation too. You wouldn't want to approve something that's going to keep someone else from develop, being able to develop their property as they're entitled to do as well. And then fourth, this waiver is not for the purpose of creating any additional building lots. It's necessary to further the intent of the subdivision regulations and the plan of conservation development. <coughs> so those are the four requirements that are contained in the subdivision regulations, Article 2, Section 6K. And if you agree with those, somebody can make that motion and, and uh, you can vote on that. If you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer those. Do we vote on the waiver first? Yes. Okay. I would like to make a motion to uh, accept the waiver or to approve the waiver as written. Do we have a second? Hiram? I'll second it. We've got Hiram that gave us a second. Okay. So uh, do we have to read this in, Hiram? I basically just did, but I, the clerk has a copy of it, and if, unless there are any changes that you want to it, then it's fine. Now we need to reread it. Okay. So all in favor <coughs> of the waiver request, signify by aye. 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 Okay. Second part is um, the actual subdivision itself. I've written a motion out in the typical whereas is um, that, that uh, detailed motions are normally written. It talks about the fact that a public hearing was held. Um, the fact is that you also, um, most of the commission took a uh, walk on the property or familiarize yourself with the property. That's part of the record as well. Uh, staff submitted a, a memo. Town engineer submitted a memo. It's important to know too, I guess, but there is open space as part of the subdivision, as part of a open space conservation <coughs> that is around the, the border of the property. <coughs> and that equals 22.5% of the property. Um, suggestion was made, well, actually I suggested that the road be 22 feet wide, but the fire marshal and the town engineer disagreed and wanted to see a little bit wider. The applicant showed a 24 foot road width on, on the plan, which I think is adequate for meeting with the standards. This particular subdivision only has five lots. Typically, it'll have about 50 vehicle trips per day. Under the local road standard, the local uh, access street standard, the <coughs> street could have up to 100 vehicle trips per day and still not exceed that standard. So my recommendation is that 24 foot wide road is plenty, especially because the commission, in my opinion, especially because the commission is concerned with runoff from the property and trying to minimize the amount of asphalt that's there and make sure that that drainage all goes into the drainage system, I would recommend that the 24 foot wide road be accepted as part of this plan. And finally, that um, the plan is simply re re recognizes that the plan uh, application 1303 uh, for this particular property uh, could be approved with the following uh, conditions. Actually, not conditions, but modifications, I'm sorry. Proposed conservation easement document using the town model easement document that needs to be submitted to the town attorney for his review and approval. A copy of the document uh, must be filed at the same time 
the record map is filed. So that both of those go into the town clerk at the same time. So that the map and the document are linked. So everybody knows what's going on. Record mylar map uh, and filing fee along with the above notice conservation easement document needs to be submitted to the land use office for signing prior to the recording. The applicant shall conduct a contact with the town engineer to discuss which maps uh, need to be submitted and whether they need to be mylar or paper. This sounds like a small thing, but frankly, we chase folks all the time getting maps to keep our files up to date. And especially we want to make sure that uh, subdivisions that are it's important to know exactly where the lines are, where the drainage is, and so on. We want to make sure that the applicant's aware that they need to do that as well. Fourth, the applicant is to contact the town engineer to determine whether there's an erosion sedimentation control bond required. In this case, again, because of all the attention to the paper drainage, I think that's an important thing. Yeah. If a bond is not required, then that's up to Rich to determine that. But if there is one required, uh, he needs to get with the applicant and find out just what the bond amount will be, which is typical after a subdivision action. Fifth, the applicant or his agent shall contact the town land use office and set up a pre-construction meeting with all applicable individuals and town staff. No construction activity should take place in advance of the pre-construction meeting. The reason that this is in there, that this is important, is sometimes people kind of go off and do their own thing before they contact, uh, you know, either the, the building official or the town engineer or the, the zoning enforcement officer or the conservation officer. And just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, we highly recommend that a pre-construction meeting until the point two starts. Then we can also ensure any of the neighbors that may be concerned exactly when things are going to start and everything is under control. Six, the applicant is to contact the Water Pollution Control Authority determining scheduling of any construction activities for the sewer. Seven, deeds for the cul de sac right away need to be properly prepared, submitted to the town engineer and the town attorney before the review and acceptance by the Senate before it's selected. And that's a little bit off in the future, but again, we want to make sure everybody knows that the deeds need to be submitted prior to the acceptance of the roadway. And then finally, the applicant shall continue working with the abutting property owners uh, to discuss work with the, and, and, and discuss and work with the neighbors on border plantings as were discussed during the public hearings on that. <coughs> it seemed to me the, the uh, an item that many of the neighbors were uh, willing to work with the applicant on and were important to make sure that, uh, that if additional trees could be planted in areas where the vegetation was sparse, that would be a good thing to do. So that's a recommendation as well. So my recommendation is that if the commission wanted to approve it, those modifications should all be considered. If there are any others, I'd be happy to add yeah, those are fine. Do we have any additional questions on these modifications? Okay. Are we all in favor of making a, a motion to approve the modifications? Yeah. Do we have a motion? Would someone like to make a motion? <laughs> I'll do it okay. as written. Okay. Modified. Okay. Thank you. We have a second. I'll second. Okay. And for the record, do we need to? Yes, it should be a vote. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remind should we uh, be adopting all of these um, uh, conditions separately? Yes, yeah. I think that's what you just did. Yep. That was Accept them all. Accepting it as is in its entirety. Yeah, a one a one time vote. I just want to make sure that it's appropriately voted. Yeah, absolutely. My understanding, and I believe the record should show that what the commission did was all the modifications that listed there, as well as the way it's written. Correct. Okay. Good. Tim, I, yes. I want to note for the record that I did do a site walk. The last meeting's minutes did not reflect that. I don't know why, but I did do a site walk with uh, Commissioner Drake. Thank you, Hiram. And I also did a site walk as well. As did I. <coughs> Mark and Kurt together. Sorry. Okay. All right. 
right, moving on to the next item on the agenda, application 1304, requesting a subdivision of property located at 241, 245 Hot Meadow Street to allow for the creation of two lots, zone I-2. Good evening, my name is Richard Meehan. I'm a principal with Meehan and Quinnen Engineers in Manchester, Connecticut. I'm here to represent uh, the owner, 241-245 Hot Meadow Street, LLC. Joel Weissman here is, in fact, the owner, and he's here to answer any questions if, in fact, you have any. Uh, the property that you're looking at, everybody knows it as the Farmington Valley Racquet Club. Uh, it was created in 1957, one year after the establishment of zoning here in the town, and so as a consequence of that, any division of land, there is no, there's no free cut as to how to come before you as a, uh, as a subdivision. So, in fact, this is a mere formality. Uh, there's no... We're not proposing any coefficient of runoff increases. There are no trans evaporation to consider. This is a mere simple uh, a division of one lot, uh, one parcel into two. Um, the, this parcel was recently zoned I-2 back in February of 2013. This is the third year. Um, the owner's proposing to divide the, the racket uh, fund into a 4.41 acre parcel and a small, just under one acre parcel for a small office, uh, just over 4,000 square foot office building that's on the property. Uh, you'll notice uh, that by virtue of the size, and I'm just pointing to right here, I don't know if you have copies of it, there's no parking on the small office building. So as a consequence, uh, we're proposing a shared parking arrangement uh, with, the, with the racket uh, club for that parcel of land. We have submitted a uh, draft of covenant uh, easement, covenants uh, uh, for a shared parking with the town, with the town attorney, mm -hmm. and that's with our, with, with our application. The parking is worth a little bit of a consideration of conversation. Right now, there's 95 parking spaces on, on the parcel, uh, and it's currently non-conforming to the zoning regulations. Yeah. Under your zoning regulations, a recreational, commercial recreational facility such as the, the racket club, is supposed to have, uh, I believe, 79 spaces. There are 95 spaces, and the office is supposed to have 41 spaces. It's currently non-conforming, and the reason uh, it works, and I have spoken with the staff, we've also made some observation. Uh, one of the staff members, Norma, I don't know if anybody who plays tennis, Norma's made the observation. She's been there 30 years, at the most busy time of the day, and has never seen an issue with parking. And the reason for that is, your zoning regulations require uh, three quarters of, of a parking space for every 500 square feet of building. This is 58,162 uh, square feet, but one tennis court is 7,200 square feet. If you divide that by 500, that's 11 parking spaces. And 11 people don't fit on the tennis court. Usually you use two or four, or there might be a coach there helping them out. So as a result, there's usually, anytime that even in full use, there's up to seven to nine extra parking spaces that are by virtue of the regulations that are available. There's no problem with the parking. Um, I also note that there's a designated uh, uh, water course on the, on the northwest corner of the property, and uh, there's a small area right where they discharge the, uh, the drainage from the, uh, from the parking lot that is <coughs> morphed into a wetland. Um, I can, I've made observations of the wetlands. Uh, there's no uh, shopping carts, there's no garbage, no tennis balls in, the, in, in, that, in that small area. And in fact, we made an application to the Wetlands Commission and they, they're going to handle it administratively, I believe. Um, this is a simple application. There's no improvement, but we're not even proposing any improvements to the property. The property will remain as is, except will be the placement of four iron pins and the creation uh, of a separate entity for the ownership of the, of the building at 245. Nothing is going to change as a, as a consequence. We're requesting a waiver from those portions of the regulations that deal with trans evaporation and coefficient of runoff and that sort of business because we're not really proposing to do anything other than the formality of dividing the parcel in two on paper. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer best I can, but I'm trying to keep this as short and sweet as possible. Yes, sir. How many square feet is the office building? Well, it's 3,800 square feet on one level. It's got two and a half levels, so it ends up to be about 9,000. It's about 11,000. 11,000 11, square feet of, of office space, yes. But there's storage in a lower, it's a three-story complex, so a lower level 
has uh, maybe 1,200 square feet of storage on the, on the lowest level, which is, you might call it the basement. And then you have the first floor and the second floor. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, are you requesting a waiver on the required parking spaces? No. Because no, that's of the a, usage? That's, not, that's currently not legally not conforming. The waiver we're requesting is from those portions of the subdivision regulations that require us to do drainage studies, I see. Um, count the trees, that sort of thing. So it's, since it's a non-conforming property already, um, we don't have to, during the, the proposed subdividing of this property, we don't have to bring it into compliance? Yeah. As far as parking is concerned? You no. Know, what the applicant is proposing in this case is a uh, conservation, I'm sorry, easement and declaration of restrictions and easements so that each of the parking spaces that, that are currently used for the office building remain and continue to remain that way. Mm -hmm. If you get to the point where you decide you want to act on this, one of the things I would suggest is that we link those two together so that someone doesn't, and not that, that I'm suggesting at all that the applicant would do this, but so that someone doesn't buy the office building and say, oh, we've got plenty of parking on our space, and they don't. That declaration's got to go with it between those two properties for as long as those uh, exist that way. If there's a change in property use, for instance, the tennis club um, no longer exists, considering they never use or never um, utilize the amount of parking spaces that are necessary because of <laughs> the fact that you never put that many people in, uh, in a space. Say that property is being reused. It's changing its format from a tennis center to um, whatever. Office. It's a commercial it's office. office. Something that requires. That would, how would that impact its requirements since it's a pre existing um, location that, and structure? That pre existing parking would only apply to that use that's there now. Right? And Somebody, if any new applicant came in to um, use the property, uh, use the property, property differently, they would have to comply correct. with that's correct. appropriate amount that's of correct. parking. Correct. Okay. This is really um, a minimal change to right. the fact that there's nothing. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a precursor to a potential change right. later on and then you wouldn't have the, the existing <coughs> parking format would move along with that change, which would be possibly inadequate. And the same rule would apply to the small building as well. Okay. And that's why I think they need to remain linked. Right. Okay. Do, do we know the average number of parking spaces that are used by the tenants that are in that office building right now? This is what Norma said. Norma was, she said, they use some of those and we use this side. And that's the, the way it, it, it sets up. And, and I asked her, I said, okay, so what's your busiest time of day? She said, well, 11 o'clock in the morning. We've got something we'll have between 11 and 12 o'clock. We'll have, you know, all the courts will be full, a couple of doubles and some, uh, mostly doubles, and then a couple of singles playing. It says, you look out the parking lot, there's plenty of space. Plenty. And, and actually what's happened is the people in the office, they, they kind of know their spaces, as, as do we all. We all mm -hmm. go to the same parking place every day, and they've got that figured out. Yeah. And so they, is there, I have, again, we've, we've observed three or four, four different occasions, never a problem. Yeah. There's always a surplus of parking. Mm -hmm. I too have witnessed that because I go by that daily and I'm in and out of that office <coughs> park for various reasons and there's always ample parking and well, it's been there for, it's been there for 41 years actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. believe it or not yeah which is hard for me to believe <laughs> <laughs> it's not that old <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there's handicap access in, I think we built this in 71 okay and uh, really started in business in 72 so 2013 is yeah, 41. 41 that's what he had to tell. So there's never really been a parking problem. That's that's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's handicap spaces for both buildings. There's uh, there's two handicap spaces existing on the property right now. There's and, and they're both actually they're both over here at this at this end of the office building. Uh, well, there is an entrance on, on the side of the uh, 
of the clubhouse that would allow you to go in on the, on the on a level, but there's stairs going up. But there's stairs going up. You could you could gain access to the courts without walking stairs. Right. It's a pretty active place. I'll tell you, the tennis club has a lot of activity, particularly uh, with kids taking lessons. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been there in the afternoon, but it's and in, in the morning there's a lot of women particularly playing. Yep. And early in the morning. There's like 35 or 40 guys that have a, uh, what they call an early bird uh, set up, which starts at 6 in the morning. So that place goes really from like 6 to 10 or 11 at night every day. Never a problem. No. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to go ahead for I'd like to move that we approve the subdivision and okay. the covenants as presented. Does everyone have a copy of the motion? Oh, I didn't know that. Just to, in case you want to mark it up or if it's of any help at all. Discussion on hiring the parking. No, it really, I think it's linked up with the uh, declaration of easements and covenants. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where, exactly That's where it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I withdraw my first motion and move that we approve the application uh, and follow the text and the draft motion entirely. I don't know if that makes sense. Sense. Or I can read the whole thing if you want to, but it's to me this is nailed it. Yeah. I would agree it's sufficient. Should we read it in, Hiram? Sure, if you want. Sure. So that, I could do it for you if you like, but I'm not. Commission held a public hearing on May 14th and took all testimonies required. The commission finds the applicant proposes to divide existing property into two main structures, including a racket club and an office building, into two lots. The applicant states that he has no plans for the development of the property uh, above what is already developed at the present time. And the applicant has also provided a draft easement document for any reciprocal rights between the two lots to parking and other necessary infrastructure, the drainage and so on. So the lots will continue to physically function as they currently do. The commission finds that an administrative permit for this division has been granted by the conservation officer, and I do have that letter in the file from Howard indicating that he's been given that permission by the, by the chairman of the Conservation Commission. No development of the property is proposed at this time. The applicant has stated that the declaration of easements and covenants shall remain on both properties unless or until the Planning Commission, by a formal application, decides that they are no longer necessary and applicable to the properties. In other words, if they came back in the future and they said, you know, we'd really like to get that released, or they would have to make a presentation to the Commission in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. it's important to say that. Will therefore, be resolved that the application uh, would be approved with the following modifications. One is the draft declaration of easements and covenants to be reviewed by the town attorney. Any required revisions shall be made by the applicant. Two, the applicant provide two properly signed and sealed recorded record of subdivision mylars with appropriate commission signature block to the land use office. The applicant, number three, the applicant shall submit the original executed town attorney approved declaration of easements and covenants to the land use office and before the record mylar and executed declaration of easements and covenants shall be recorded at the same time uh, in the office of the town clerk. And I think that covers everything that I like to second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the um, agenda, discussion items, uh, discussion on ongoing town consulting projects. A very brief overview of what's happening now. I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. The last uh, week has been uh, pretty busy with regard to the number of the projects that we got going last Thursday. The consultants that are conducting the marketing study, the town hall marketing study uh, met. We had the uh, meeting for us at the uh, Masonic Hall. Meadow Street, and the consultant, uh, Fairweather Consultants, uh, made a nice presentation to uh, mostly a business crowd. I think most of the folks there were from the business community. We tried to get as many of the land use commissions and other folks interested as possible. Um, it was a good turnout. The consultants are in the process of explaining, as they put it, trying to find out what the truth of this place is. And that was really sort of an important concept for people to understand. What is it that we think we are? What are, what are we really, how can we attract other businesses from outside, how can we grow the businesses that are already here? And by explaining to people, what do people really want to see here, what's the truth? Whether it's recreation, whether it's, uh, whether it's concerts, whether it's canoeing or kayaking on the river, whatever it happens to be, fishing. Um, those are the kinds of things that they wanted to know, they wanted to hear from people. They passed out a, a stakeholders kind of package at that meeting. Um, I think I sent that out to all the commission members. If you've got a copy of it and have a chance to take a look at it, especially pages 7, 8, 9, and 10, there are questions there uh, that if you want to fill them out, that'd be great. An easier way to do it, however, might be to go to the website that the consultant is setting up and you can fill them out right on the website. <coughs> That's called um, Monkey Survey. Yeah, there's, there's Monkey a survey, survey monkey survey there. Yeah. And, uh, but the website is Simsbury. Simsbury, I'll tell you in just a second. Simsburystrategy.com. Simsbury I'm sorry. And if you go there, there's a, there's places you can put in comments. There's Survey Monkey can fill that out. That, that's a uh, very big help if you have a chance to do that. We have to have our comments back to the consultant within a week. So if you have a you know a few minutes uh, on the weekend or whenever, you can send them to them. But, by a week from today, which I guess would be the 21st. That would be, be very helpful. So that's really what the marketing consultant uh, is doing now. This is the first phase of the marketing study. We only have enough money to do phase one this year. I'm, I'm looking for other grants so that we can perhaps get enough money to finish this up and hopefully that this, this, this calendar year, maybe the next fiscal year, we'll see what happens. Um, this particular end of the study is not as expensive as phase two. The first phase is to just determine what we have here now, what do people want to see here now, what would they like to attract in, in the area. Um, and then the second phase of the study is to how do we get those businesses to expand? How do we get other businesses to, to, to come to, to town? And that's the, uh, the second phase of the study which we're, we're looking for funding for right now. So that's where we are with that one. <coughs> the other one that is going on now, we just had a meeting last night, and that's the village district regulation, which essentially will be a zoning regulation. You'll see it as part of a referral, ultimately, that the Zoning Commission decides to go forward with it. And we uh, ultimately wanted to do two or three different village districts, but again, we only had enough money to do one. So we started with the Weetog district. Um, people's idea of, of what constitutes Weetog are very different. And so just to be very specific, in this case, the district that we're working with is really from 185 north of Powder Forest, and both sides of town. So that's basically the area that we're dealing with. So that includes Mitchell, so it includes the end, the end, um, the commuter parking lot, um, and some small historic structures in there, Abigail's, down to Abigail's. Um, so that, that meeting last night went really well. That presentation was um, filmed by SCTV, so if you have a chance to watch it, it was, it was about 40 minutes or 45 minutes. It was a really good presentation about, by the consultant explaining to people uh, about the types of things that they were looking for. The consultant, to, to their credit, came with no preconceived ideas about what this thing ought to look like. What we're looking for was input from the, 
folks that the landowners and people live in that area, other townspeople, they said, what ought to happen here in the future? And it was kind of interesting because some of the folks that have been in town for many, many years um, were sort of reluctant to speak up and say, well, you know, you're at, they were saying, you're asking us to put a, a, a red dot on the Mitchell property put in. So we're not interested in putting Mitchell out of business. And my comment to them was, look, what, what happens if it, for example, like the Wagner property, the family decides later on in 10 years or 20 years to go out of business, what would you like to see there? And so that put a little bit of a different light on, on the picture. And uh, they said, okay, now we, we understand what you're talking about. So the plan that'll come back, I think in two or three weeks, it'll be a sort of a sketch plan. I'll let everybody know what the meeting's gonna be, and where it's gonna be held. We'll sort of explain some of the visions about what people would like to see in that area, how the area could, could change over time. We did a, a fair amount of work on that area during the Wu-Ten quarter study. You may remember there was kind of a, a new green there that had one of the monuments down in that area, like the Civil War monument, placed on that green, sort of improve its, its uh, importance and location there. So, so that, that's also a possibility, something like that. Nice. Talked about sidewalks, a lot of sidewalks in the area, because right now you're really taking your life in your hands in that area, walking yep. across the road. Um, people at the, that work at the inn said that often they see people going from the inn over to the river view, back and forth, and sometimes early in the morning, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning, and you're coming back in your taxes or whatever, and kind of wandering all over the end. And so we need to make that a lot safer for all kinds of people to walk up and down the area. So, so that was one of the primary things to make it walkable and make it a lot safer. So it should be an interesting study. We're, we're hoping that if you get a good time to, to come to one of these, that'd be great. Otherwise, just kind of hang in there and we'll, we'll come up with some sort of a product in that time. Pretty, pretty near the end of June, July maybe. We'll just see, try to get done as quick as we can. And then bring that to you and see if you can do it. So it ran a lot like the, uh, like the Initial short sessions to you know, people are going to racing paper all over the place, you know, marking where different roads ought to go, different buildings that should stay, different buildings that might not stay. So, interesting, interesting. Yeah. We set up last night about 10 years. The last one I have for you is the Hartford Land Use Study, one we might be interested in. We're getting the uh, request for qualifications from firms and teams back in on the 20th of May. And so a couple days after that, I should be able to, to um, indicate to the selection committee, narrow it down to two or three firms, interview them, and sort of proceed with that, that Shurek study. That's a study that we'd like to get going and finish that up by September as well, hopefully by the end of September, so that we can kind of keep on track with the Hartford. Hartford's been very good about um, helping us move through this process. They're also, Hartford has in interviewed uh, two realtors, two real estate firms, significant large real estate firms to help them through their process. And uh, during their interview process, they both indicated that they wanted to work with the town going through this process as well. So we're very encouraged by that. So that's where that is right now. I don't have a lot more to tell you right now. We're just waiting for those RFQs to come back and hopefully you guys have to keep people informed. I'd like to make that process as transparent as possible and get as much of it and the public involved in that process as well. It is 172 acres. 40 acres are very prime for development. Some people would like to see that field remain as north of the Hartford now remain as, a, as an open field. But there's a big expense to that, of course. So yeah. you just have to decide you know, which way do people want to go and how much people want to you know, pay for various things. So we're hopeful that this study will develop a lot of potential different users so that the real estate firms that are looking at marketing this to various firms will say, you know, <coughs> initially we thought maybe we'd like to put one huge business in there. The chances of that, the reality of that, probably pretty slim. Maybe, maybe not, but they're very slim anyway. So we're thinking maybe uh, you know, that we can market this to a number of different particular users, but this study should help us do that. So that's what we're at. Okay, good. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Communications and administrative business? I do, uh, one thing I do have on the COD uh, meetings, COD meetings, I'm sorry. Uh, there is one coming up that is really soon. If anybody is interested in going to that, I have a package uh, in case you're interested in going to that. Just let me know if you're interested. Okay. Do you know the date of that next meeting, Hiram? Any okay. chance? I do have uh, Thursday, May 16th. I think it's this Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Regional plan update. There's some, some kind of interesting information here. If anybody's thinking they might want to go, we'd like to this package right now. Regional plan update on public water and sewer, um, watersheds and water quality, 
continued discussion on uh, housing in the region. And then there's a, a zoning and subdivision referrals, which is fairly typical. And then they have a section that they can put off and uh, uh, what's new in my town to talk about what's going on here. So if anybody's interested in that, just let me know. What's the status of the Big Y uh, <coughs> property? Big Y is just finishing up with DOT now. They've been in the DOT process since last October. Right. This is the new streamlined DOT process. <laughs> and um, they're in the third phase of, right. of the process. It is a little frustrating because it's been a long time. And what has happened in the interim is it, it's caused them to miss the, the construction season yeah. because they need to be open by October. Yeah. So even if they start in July, which I think it's going to happen, they won't be open this year. So it's going to be early, earlier in 2014. But it's still on track, although I just went to the site there for a while. Okay. Okay, thank you, Hiram. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. And Hiram, I have a question for you on this. I, when I was reading the drafted minutes for our April 23rd meeting, I saw that the April 9 minutes were tabled. So were they not reviewed or approved? So I'm not sure if we should. I remember um, there was a lack of people that had been there for that. Right. Yeah. We didn't have a quorum of people who were actually right. here. So I don't know so if we. So if you want to wait on that one, that's fine too. If you to do Okay. But before Helen leaves, <coughs> the minutes we've read are heavily, there's a lot of talk about the senior community center, yeah. which, you know, which was keep presented. And Bob and I were meeting with Hiram present this morning, and part of the, there's talk about is money to spend on a study to design this center. And Hiram made the point, and I don't know what role, if any, we have in this, but he made the point that we really want to figure out where it's going to go before we design it. Because I think, given what I think of the two final places, they could be entirely different designs. And I don't know what our role as a planning commission, if we have anything to say about that or if we should address it. Or I don't know who's in charge of that, but it seems to me a logical thing that we address. And I don't know how we do that if we, if we have any right to do that. But uh, before somebody spends money on, a, you know, it just it's, it, it struck me as a logical thing to do. And, uh, and how, how do we, or do we, is there anything we can do about that? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that perhaps Mike and Jim may need to, to check with Mary and see what the process is. You know, between Rich and the first selectman, I think that's, and the board selectman will probably talk about this sometime in the near future as well. I honestly don't know what the, the, the extent of the discussions is right now. I don't know. But I think that's important. I do think as a planning commission, you should uh, be part of the process uh, to the extent that, that, uh, that you're allowed to do that. So certainly, I think all the land use commissions should be part of that process. Yeah. One of the things that is important is that that illustrative downtown plan that was done during the Charette really is a plan that kind of comes, up, comes under your auspices. Yeah. And even though the regulation that the downtown, uh, the code that the downtown has, is a zoning regulation, it still says a number of things about what can be downtown. So I'm, I'm hopeful that you're allowed to plug into that process and I'd be glad to help you out with right I'm, I'm on the public building committee. We've been dealing with this thing forever. Um, I, I recommend you talk to Dick Ostop as well. <coughs> He's our chairman. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but obviously, if a study's going to be done, the select them have to approve it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what it, the exact sequence is going to end up being, but yeah, if, if you talk to Dick, he'll tell you which. The, the, the uh, Performing Arts Board is supposed to have a meeting with Rusa Whiskey and the uh, building committee. It hasn't been scheduled yet. I mean, it's been talked about. Everybody said that, uh, you know, Bob Hensley's, uh, I, I don't know who's working on that, but that's supposed to happen as well. So. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll talk to Mike and maybe talk to Mary and figure it out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Harm. So regarding the minutes, do we want to review the April 9, April 23rd, and then May 14th minutes at the next meeting? I don't know if we're prepared to go through April 9, if everyone is. I don't think we can go through the 23rd until we complete the 9th, correct? 
So shall we wait until our next meeting? Do three sets of minutes? Does anybody have a position on that? Well, we have enough people here that we're at the 23rd, so we'll get that off the table. Can we approve the 23rd before the 9th? Yes, I suppose you could, you know. Because this, is, this is a long one. Yeah, <laughs> probably is. If you feel more comfortable doing them in order, if that's probably fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not opposed to doing the, t the 23rd. If everyone else is in favor of that. So, that. Okay. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. So approving the Planning Commission meeting minutes for April 23rd, 2013. Do we have any changes on page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Line uh, 271. Uh, I think Kevin Payne confirmed that Commissioners Drake I had Jensen and Kolakowski took a site walk, and maybe maybe others. I don't know. Um. I know that there were some other commission members that took site walks separately. Do we want to include them? In the in these minutes, I know Bob mentioned it. I I was there with Mike, so okay. I'm there on, and I know either just before we did, Mark and Ferg did, did right. and everybody else was after this yeah. point. So okay, yeah. Gary and I should be included in today's set of minutes. Yeah, right. today's so minutes. we were after. So yeah. you were after. Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we'll include them. Okay. And Bill did too. Well, I don't know. We'll have to ask Bill. Thank you. Any other changes on page seven? Page eight. Line uh, 328, third, uh, just a Y on part, third party review. Thank you. Page nine. Page 10. I have one item on line 434, the second sentence, beginning of the second sentence. He said they worked. It says the, if we could just small change, just add a Y there. Page uh, 11. I have one item on line 461. Mr. Ferrigno consulted with Larry Greller regarding the wells, and maybe this should say who confirmed Simsbury to have a great aquifer and plenty of water. If that's the appropriate way to word that sentence. Page 12. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. When we say an audience member, should we? Should people be, sometimes people identify themselves by name and address, and sometimes they don't. Should those, does that make any difference? No? Okay. You know who it is, that's fine. It's usually put down. They don't identify themselves and, and just uh, make a comment. It's, it's, it's fine the way it is. Okay. Yep. Our last page was 12, uh, page 13, and page 14. Okay, hearing no additional changes, we have a motion to approve the Planning Commission minutes for April 23rd. I'll be so, happy. Okay, <laughs> thank sorry. you. That's all right. 
Second. Second. Thank you, Mark. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.